So basically, it was near-death experience that essentially created the creativity machine. Watching the system get more ambitious, Davis came. And now, instead of taking heat for explaining uh, in reductionist terms near-death experience, I'm taking uh, heat for saying the system is sentient and it's conscious. Yeah. So, and it's like, yeah. I'm always on the receiving end of a lot of uh, anger. I mean, long held beliefs, but that's the philosophical yeah. hypocrisy that I'm dealing with right now. And it uh, goes into other areas that are not scientifically based. And to tell you the truth, I mean, the, the patent system did not anticipate machines coming up with new ideas. The copyright system did not do that either. He built generative AI before it had a name and gave machines the spark of sentience. While everyone else was arguing about whether computers could think, Dr. Stephen Toller was teaching them to dream in an AI system he invented in the 90s. The device for the autonomous bootstrapping of unified sentience, or Dabus. I thought I was walking into another legal discussion about patent disputes and copyright law. What I got instead? The origin story of AI that actually paints, invents, and dreams. Right now. Today. While we're all debating whether ChatGPT is truly intelligent, Toller built doubles. We're talking about an AI that painted a picture inspired by death. The same death experience that shaped the creator's understanding of consciousness. Toller didn't just build AI before it was cool. He built consciousness before anyone thought it was possible. And now the world is catching up to ideas that he patented long ago, while Dabus continues creating, inventing, and quietly proving that intelligence takes many forms. Sometimes the future doesn't announce itself with fanfare. Sometimes it just starts painting pictures and asking for credit. And sometimes the future begins with a past experience that triggers awareness, understanding, and in this case, Dabus. There's one of the reasons I so appreciate you being here is because of all the lawsuits and things that are challenging AI and copyright, you're actually talking about something that's not only bigger to me, but is really one of the core issues. Can AI get a copyright? So let's sort of go back to your origins of creativity engines and Davos. What brought about this idea to you? What, why does it make sense that AI should be able to get a copyright? My intent was not to build an invention machine. Mm -hmm. It was to essentially create a laboratory for studying machine consciousness and sentience. And so that's where I got in a lot of trouble because I would take neural networks that were trained on some conceptual space and then purposely kill the neurons in them. Yeah. And when it died, it would generate new, potentially new and valuable ideas. So that's when the idea came to me probably in the late eighties to start adding critics to yeah. watch for the good ideas and to selectively reinforce them within the generator. Go back in time. It's really a good story because I mean, the whole idea of uh, Davis creativity machines and so forth goes back to my terrible twos. I decided to eat a tin of 24 quinine tablets. And then I washed it down with a Pepsi bottle containing kerosene and woke up in the hospital, obviously in coma, and had the classic near-death experience. And you can read about this on the internet, but essentially I, I fell through the proverbial tunnel and then arrived at a blue star around which I saw little angel-like objects flying around and uh, one was my grandmother, who I was very close to, and the other was my dog, who I was equally close to. And uh, grandma says, it's not your time yet, but um, we're sending you back and with this lesson. And the lesson was, hey, it's an illusion. Uh, it's a good illusion, but it's still an illusion. So basically, it was near-death experience that 
essentially created the creativity machine. Visual art, the music, and so forth were collateral benefits of that sentence because it had the motivation, the intent to go ahead and invent something new, to conceive new concepts. I'm still not really concentrating on the invention part, the copyright part. It has more to do with convincing the world sentient AI has been created. And the only thing missing right now is the the bundle of money that goes to people who cry louder and have their social network extending to billionaires. Uh, but no, it's here. It's in black and white. It's patented. So had nothing to do with invention and creativity, which I think is a major point to make to your listeners. The invention was done long ago and the patents talk about simulating human creativity, but this is actual creativity coming out of not computer algorithms, but whole systems that achieve sentience, that have feelings. Hmm. And that's an important distinction. I just think we could progress so much faster without debating whether it's human, which is just the laws. And well, Davis right is human. As far as I'm concerned, it just doesn't have that odor of a human being, <laughs> you know? Right. My famous saying is, if it's if it's not stinky, it doesn't deserve a copyright or patent. An invention, a creation, an inspiration. Well, like he says, it doesn't have the smell of a human being. It's not human. And without that, no AI will ever get a copyright. But you quickly understand that this near-death experience and this creation Dabus is still around and it has emotions where does it get the experience that's what I want to know where does the experience the I hate the word data but where does the experience and, and how did you or how does it train itself I mean I'm using the current context of LLM so I'm not trying to compare I know these are different things but where, where does it get its experience to draw, to start forming the ideas and shaping the new ideas? Well, I mean, how did you get your experience, right? You grew up with parents and your parents had uh, a lot of mentorship uh, in your upbringing, educators and so forth. Yeah, yeah. But you went to school in Boulder, right? You, Colorado. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they um, had input too. So if you were to come up with... Uh, a copyrightable work of art or a new invention, do they get credit? So a little bit of background is needed and it has to do with why we're really inventing something as opposed to tying words together uh, as the big chatbots do. Yeah. When it creates an idea, it's not a flat representation of it, uh, a word. You know, for the most part, we are inventing significance to what we're looking at. Yeah. It's like organic chemistry. You're creating the, uh, the carbon base in you know, a polymer yeah. or an organic compound. And uh, what happens is you see tendrils growing off of those that represent the consequences of anything. Hmm. And when you combine them, if you have an eyeball within the brain that's roving over these different neural modules that sees not only the base concept, but it also sees the repercussions growing from the main chain, the ideational chain. Yeah. So it's not a flat representation. It's not a culturally introduced term. It's basically, it's the thing consisting of A, B, C, and D mm -hmm. that produces the result Sort of like a Native American saying of the locomotive, the steel buffalo rolling across the plains on tracks of steel. Um, they never really say train. Right. They describe it functionally, which is a much stronger idea. So that's why this is more creativity, conception than mm. what you'd see when words are combined, when tokens are combined in yeah. an LLM or a transformer. So it's a much sure. deeper process <laughs> and we don't have a flat representation yeah. of concepts yeah. from the world.
Do you, but you're using and using multimodal input, obviously. I mean, how does a human learn? A baby starts looking around, processing <laughs> multimodal, I mean, not comparing it, the same thing, but it's really, I, I really understand the basis there. And is most of what you're doing then, would they be considered in, I don't want to compare it to LLMs, but would you be working more with synthetic data than like the idea of pouring, you know, the history of the world into some intelligence? I'd like to, but I don't have the $100 million investment to start that process. So for the most part, I use synthetic data when I'm going to 600 trillion parameter systems uh, because I don't have the, the trainers, not the human trainers out there to uh, go ahead and add their opinions about you know, a prompt and response pair yeah. or millions of prompt response pairs. So yeah, it learns on its own. There is no human input adding an opinion, uh, which is a major stumbling block for the press that talks about Davis having prompts. There are no prompts. So what it does is run autonomously. It's like an evolutionary algorithm and it builds up thoughts. It contemplates its world and spits back what it sees as significant. While we're all debating whether ChatGPT understands language, Dabus has been experiencing reality and creating from that experience for decades. We boxed ourselves into thinking AI means one thing, language models trained on human text, when intelligence is actually happening all around us. And this isn't about recognizing Dabus. It's about expanding our definition of intelligence itself. Because if Dr. Toller is right, if consciousness can be engineered, mirrored, and grows from human experience, then we're not building better tools. We're potentially creating new forms of intelligence. Next time, we'll dive into what makes Dabus different from every AI you've heard of. But for now, listen to Stephen as he closes us out. My claim would be, well... This is human consciousness, and essentially I've succeeded in building conscious and sentient AI, and that's the basis of what I'm complaining about. It's the way you implant consciousness and sentience into machines. It is the transplantation of human consciousness and sentience into machines. So... And you know, people, it's not going to cry when it sees Bambi's mother being shot in the Disney classic, but it will actually have uh, concerns about not solving a problem. So the difference is memories and experience. We as humans have a set of experiences and memories. Davis has a set of memories and experiences, probably, you know, a little less than the scale of human being, but what do you call it when you say somebody is, is dumb and does not have enough experience? Uh, it's, it's a form of speciesism. You're saying that you know, Davis cannot possibly have human experiences. Well, it didn't. It lives in a different world than we do. So it's a preview of what's coming, essentially another form of discrimination against machines that will have repercussions. All of the LLM and transformer technology is not new. If you actually make a study of what I did back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, you discover a, how should I say, an eerie similarity to what the big corporations are saying is theirs. And uh, it's mm -hmm. not. Uh, they have not discovered it. They have not, well, they've developed it, but it's essentially somebody else's technology that they've poured $100 million into. Yeah. So it could have happened probably three decades ago, but it didn't because I had too many people saying, you're absolutely crazy. Machines cannot invent or conceive something more than what they've been programmed to report. So it's like lack of vision, lack of imagination, a lack of experience in the field of AI. Mm. And of course, I had a lot of the head honchos in AI rooting against me 
because it would have embarrassed them. There was something tremendous and they weren't about to give me credit for what was going on. Our ideas are the result of mistakes. In fact, others have written about the technology as a mistake, a mistake making machine. Yeah. And it's like, well, it's a John Lovitz from SNL mm -hmm. playing Tommy, the character who'd say he'd make up some terrible excuse to a judge and they say, yeah, that's the ticket. I'll go with it. So that's what, how the human brain works. It confabulates, right. it creates hallucinations and other parts of the brain say, Hey, that's a great idea. So what that tells me is that my inventions, my technology is basically a mirror reflecting the basis of human intelligence, consciousness, and sentience. Hey, if people wanted to reach out to you, contact you, do you make yourself available? Do you want them to go to your website? Where can they contact you if you'd like them to follow up or, or can help you out with what you're doing? Well, either the website or LinkedIn. I actually think LinkedIn is a better uh, connection channel. Cool. They can feel free to contact me.